Right, David, your report. Thanks, Chair. And uh, we've got a meeting with uh, colleagues in the uh, uh, senior level on uh, Friday on uh, planning for the state of care report for next year, just to pick up on that point. So, um, so my report, um, Chair. So, um, uh, this is an update report on um, work that has been going on over uh, the four weeks since our last meeting. I draw attention to the signposting documents, progress on the inspection programme and the care bill. I don't intend to dwell on those, uh, David. Um, I will spend most of my time on the fit and proper person test and um, the duty of candour. So, uh, fit and proper person test. Um, these are proposals which will um, allow us to carry out, um, well, will require a fit and proper person test to be uh, carried out as part of the recruitment and appointment process for directors of organisations that are registered with us. The proposal is that um, any organisation undertakes a fit and proper person test for uh, people uh, who they're taking on to their uh, board. So it is part of, and they will then make a legal declaration um, uh, that the organisation uh, have got to sign uh, when they apply to CQC that they've carried out that fit and proper person test. So the onus is on the organisation itself to give us reassurance that they've appointed people who are fit and proper. And this picks up on uh, some of the issues around whether, um, as a result of some of the investigations and inquiries that have gone on into places like Winterbourne, there's been a view that the people that have held positions at a senior level, uh, not at an uh, operational service delivery level, have indeed been fit and proper people. And this allows us to, uh, as I say, take uh, uh, some uh, reassurance from organisations and that then allows us to hold those organisations to account if people are found not to be fit and proper people. Um, so that's the objective. Um, the uh, Where this will work out is CQC staff are involved in discussions with predominantly uh, DH officials about how this will be taken forward and the objective is that this new uh, in inverted commas, a fit and proper regime requirement will be in from October 2014. So what I've identified uh, in paragraph four is some of the actions which are taking place to allow us to get to the position that we're able to uh, work with this requirement from October 14. So if I pause there, Chair. Mm. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think that, that slightly uh, exasperates the public is that when a, uh, a trust or an organisation is found to have failed in some way and there's an investigation, by the time that investigation reports, a lot of the people who might have been culpable have already moved. Uh, and the response of the organisation is often to say, well, uh, you know, this particular person that particular, who are identified in the report, uh, that's true, but they have gone. They're no longer part of our organisation. And quite often, they are part of another organisation somewhere else. In other words, already appointed, um, already part of somewhere where the fit and proper person test cannot catch them because they're already in post. Uh, and so the, it's the, the, the speed with which people move around the system when things are going wrong is, is, will run against this and the fact that it is applying at the point of appointment will run against this. So I just wonder whether, given that um, our role in ensuring it's properly um, operating, how, how we will be able to address that. So where people are found not to be fit and proper, that will go on the record and that will allow us to actually be clear. So that will go to people. So that's exactly the purpose of having a fit and proper person test and allowing us to take action against it. And because we'll take that action and when we confirm that action, that will be public, it will then be a matter of public record that somebody is found not to be fit and proper. And that will, uh, in a sense, um, be with them. But it's exactly the issue about how that will operate um, uh, that needs to be teased out amongst some of the other practical arrangements. But it, for practitioner staff, there's the uh, barring system that exists, which acts as a record that can run and, um, and in effect follow people, where if people are disqualified, then uh, there is a record of that. 
we need to work through this so we can actually get into this position of um, ensuring that people are not moving around the system as you've um, identified uh, that is the case hitherto and this is a move to actually prevent that happening. There is an issue about whether there will be a register of people who are fit and proper and that's one of the issues that needs to be teased out and the legal issues that surround that are um, um, occupying a lot of the conversations in that okay then if this is the objective to have a fit and proper person test how is this going to operate and exactly how will you then check people that have been found not to be fit and proper so the etiology of this is really Winterbourne where the convictions were of those care staff who were committing the offences against the individuals but there was no way of holding any of the people in those senior positions in that care group to account for um, any um, uh, in effect negligence that they allowed that to happen when they were responsible for quality so this is trying to um, uh, introduce a system that allows um, where people have uh, been in supervisory uh, positions uh, where those kind of offences have taken place there is a way of holding them to account and ensuring that they don't do as you've said Lewis turn up somewhere else okay Therefore, basically, I can. <coughs> yeah, I mean, the the, the 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 point is the retrospective nature, I suppose, as well. That's the. Uh, I mean, you don't need to respond to that. But if the details are still to be worked out, that that ability to um, to learn from uh, an investigation where something has gone wrong, but then apply it uh, fairly, even though the system might have helped people who are culpable to have moved elsewhere already, and therefore to have escaped the the consequences of uh, of the test. Well, I think the way this would work is, um, yes, it would be after an event, by definition. Um, typically what happens in relation to this is there are checks whether d d people in director positions have been bankrupt before and that runs through companies' house, etc. There's no way of actually running a check about whether people have been in organisations where there's been repeatedly poor quality of care. You, we can do something about registered managers and not approving registered managers, but those that sit above registered managers, there's a lacunae at the minute in terms of any reach that we've got to stop people just closing down one organisation, moving into another and then repeating those. So yes, it is post hoc, but it isn't always retrospective. It'll, uh, this can be a preventative measure of stopping people that have been identified as being less than suitable, not fit and proper people, from cropping up again in organisations in the future. But it's this issue about whether there's a register or not a register that needs to be teased out, and that's a how-to question. David, Chair. Sorry. Um, the, the Let's, so there's a big job of work to be done there in terms of work, working it, it through. Let's assume that um, well, you'll end up with a version of what, what it looks like and how, how one can track people to make sure that they've been identified. But once we've reached that stage, is it the assumption that this new regime will then be applied only going forward? In other words, that in effect everyone who is currently in a post will be grand grandfathered into uh, 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 the, 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 the new uh, arrangements or is it the suggestion which frankly I would feel much more comfortable with that actually there's an onus on all the organizations in the system then to reflect on who they have in these key posts against the criteria which have been assessed for fit and proper and take a judgment at that time as if they were making an appointment um, such that when we are next in to expect, inspect we can uh, we, we, we can look at the, the judgments that they've made because I, I, I fear that, uh, that if we only do it as something which um, is for the future the past will uh, continue to catch up with us all the time um, there'll be a, a, a series of, of uh, I mean, incidents as there will be um, uh, uh, in which uh, people who are culpable in the way that Lewis has described from um, past events um, direct, directly or less directly, will uh, have will prove to be um, in important positions in new organisations, and the system won't have sp spotted it because we'll have grandfathered them all into it. Um, so I think there are, there are two parts to this. So there's the the future looking bit, and so uh, once the regulation and so forth is in place, um, systematically chairs will have to tell us that they're comfortable, as, as David's outlined. Um, but that doesn't stop us at all from being retrospective as well. If there are particular care failings that we 
in whatever judgment uh, threshold we put in place, say that's something that's so bad that's happened in the past, if there are any directors in the system running different providers, we, would want, we can then uh, challenge the, the chairs as to why that, that person is still in post, so it doesn't have to be only future looking at all. That, that's that's good. That that that's but that that's a case by case basis, which we'd have to identify as having been a serious incident, rather than the approach which um, I I hear is being outlined here, which is to put the onus on uh, 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 those in, uh, in 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 leadership positions in any institution to take a view about their staff, um, and. You know, going forward, they'll have to do it on your appointment, but I'm just wondering if there's something that we should ask them to do of all those people in senior posts at the point at which this regime is put in place, which is slightly different. So why don't we bring that back? Uh, one of the issues here is the risk that you're flagging up, and I think the other thing we need to take into account is whether uh, with the 44,000 registered providers we've got, we're going to in effect go through another re-registration. And I think the organisation has an awful lot to learn from uh, how that has challenged it previously. So I think the point that you're raising, Anna, is absolutely spot on in terms of um, how we get that reassurance. I come back to this issue that it's really not for us to check, it's for the boards and the chairs to confirm. So let us work out how the spirit of what you've said can be built into the plans moving forward and the way the regulations are going to be drafted that will give us the power to do this. And um, this is work in progress. So the difficulty in answering the detailed questions is it really is live work. And I think other issues from the Francis stuff have dominated the agenda and this is now something that needs to be worked through. So um, we'll pick up the point that Lewis has made and the point that you've made as we move forward. Chair, I, mean, I was just going to agree with Paul's point, which is that uh, if an inquiry finds somebody not to be a, pre a fit and proper person, then in my view that, just because they have moved on to another job, doesn't mean that the question of whether they should occupy that job is is not possible to be pursued. It must be possible to be pursued both by the organisation which is the current employer of that person and by us as the regulator asking questions of that particular organisation. And I don't think there's any, I mean, I think Paul's absolutely right about that. It seems to be quite clear that that's the position. I think the difficulty is, in a sense, whether we rely on um, the news getting out that that's where the person has moved to, or whether by requiring not only a statement that fit and proper people have been appointed, but who the names of those people are, so that we build up some sort of, of database which we can then use to track through where people have gone. That seems to me to be the difficult, difficult question which got, has got to be addressed in your, in your in further work, because that depends on the amount of, of work that we need to undertake, the burden and the cost to us of maintaining that register. It's interesting, this discussion. And we, so, some of us had a meeting with the Financial Conduct Authority um, a week or two ago, and I think they're further down the track than we are on this, um, not least because I think the financial services industry had a bigger, a uh, huge problem on this, where they had boards of directors with no clue about what was going on in their, in their bank or their insurance company. I, can I encourage you to have another chat, you know, detailed chat with them? Because I think they have done a lot more. Th they are further ahead of than us, I think, in this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone, anyone else like to comment on this? We. Mm. Um, it, it's uh, um, not. It's a very specific issue, and it's the extent to which we um, look at a person's health in regard to the fit and proper persons test. I don't know if we will do that, but there are a number of sort of. It's a bit of a minefield, particularly in terms of equ equalities. So, um, you know, when we're doing the further work, um, it would be helpful to know if, if we, you know, what <coughs> questions will be asked about somebody's health, if they will be asked, what questions will be asked, and to make sure that it's kind of fits with equalities legislation as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I don't think it is about health at all. Okay. You're talking about physical or mental health, are you? Either. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about whether they're proper, morally proper people and qualified people. And that's correct, isn't it, David? Yeah, it's integrity. In it's integrity, yeah. You okay. carry on. Yeah, um, so... The second related issue is in relation to the duty of candour. Um, this is an issue which... Um, 
has arisen as a direct consequence of Robert Francis's inquiry into mid staffs and um, it's a key and significant part of the care bill which was uh, introduced into the Commons for its second reading on Monday of this week and um, the objective is in addition to the already existing contractual duty to promote a more open culture uh, with patients and others where mistakes have been made that have affected the safety uh, of those receiving uh, care. The department will consult on the regulations which will introduce uh, the duty of candour and give us some responsibilities in relation to uh, how that duty is being discharged by organisations. That will come out in January of next year and will be for a 12-week uh, consultation. I think the arguments around this and why Robert Francis has introduced it are pretty well rehearsed. Uh, the debate um, about this is at the threshold at which this statutory duty should apply. Um, the debate really has uh, uh, been split into uh, uh, two parts. One is saying that this should be restricted to patient safety incidents which result in death or severe harm. That's similar to the national reporting and learning system and um, was supported by the Berwick Review. And our calculations are that would equate to about 11,000 incidents per year. Uh, Robert Francis, in his recommendations, talked about death and serious harm. The distinction here is uh, the difference between severe and serious. And, um, uh, and that potentially includes those incidents which are classified as moderate harm, and that could, uh, on estimations, go to about 100,000 incidents per year. Um, if we just go in that direction, that will be consistent with the existing contractual duty that, uh, in the NHS uh, on the duty of candour, and it's consistent with guidance that some organisations follow on uh, entitled Being Open, and is a position which, um, well, Anna will speak for herself, but I think is supported by Healthwatch, uh, Action on Medical Accidents and National Voices, as well as other organisations. Um, Colleagues in uh, CQC who have been working on this have been working with a number of those organisations. It's also uh, important to emphasise that this is in addition to the professional duty which sits on individual practitioners, particularly individual registered practitioners around uh, this issue, doctors, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, OTs, etc. Et um, the... Um, Secretary of State, when he announced the government's response to Robert Francis's report, announced that he'd invited David Dalton, the chief executive of the Salford Royal uh, NHS Foundation Trust, and Norman Williams, the current president of the Royal College of Surgeons, to undertake a review uh, on uh, this issue and the impact of reporting. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that there's a considerable under-reporting of these incidents and um, uh, I think the last sentence in the paragraph the third paragraph in my report is probably not entirely accurate it's not that it will be an increase in responsibility but if there's to be an increase in reporting then that will be an increase in uh, activity that the trust will undertake rather than responsibility um, but the truth is we don't know the degree of uh, under-reporting uh, in relation to these incidents so um, uh, evidence from Canada uh, quotes uh, uh, figures between 7 and 15 per cent, but um, uh, there's more work required to understand that in this country. I think the key issue is whether the reporting of incidents is part of a culture of learning and improvement in the trust, and whether this is intelligence that's used to drive improvements in the quality and safety of care for people. Uh, and the argument, put simply, about whether it's um, uh, whatever the language is used, whether it's severe or serious, um, is uh, how um, that will drive improvements and whether more reporting to a regulator will drive people into a position where they don't feel comfortable in reporting or whether it will encourage and incentivise people to report. And that seems to be the axis on which uh, the discussion is tipping. Um, I think being on the side of patients, uh, which is uh, being on the side of people that use services, 
takes me to a much more comprehensive reporting policy. It takes us into a situation where I think we should be looking uh, at moderate harm and going for that larger definition which is consistent with uh, serious and not sticking in that severe. Uh, the very last uh, paragraph in uh, this section says it would be presumptive of CQC. David and myself were talking before the meeting. I've certainly had um, email correspondence since these papers went onto the public agenda with Peter Walsh, who's saying um, you need to say what you think. So, uh, if I may share my personal view on this, uh, my recommendation to the board is that CQC should adopt a position which takes a more comprehensive view and we should go for uh, serious harm, which would mean that um, it's those incidents classified as uh, causing moderate harm that should be reported to us and that should be part of the intelligence that we then use to inform the way that we inspect uh, hospitals, uh, community health care services, mental health services uh, and other services. And I think those principles should apply to our work on adult social care, even though the legislation is specific in a particular area. So um, if I re uh, leave that uh, item there and I'll, uh, uh, if you turn. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike, Mike first, yeah. Really just to give a few comments from the perspective of what we've already seen uh, as we've been around the, the, the first date in trust. Um, we have seen, first of all, a huge variation in reporting. Uh, now, it, it is always possible that there are more incidents at one trust than another, but even when you take account of the size of the trust, it's most improbable that that, that is actually right. And in fact, one of the trusts where we've had greatest concerns has been at the lower end of reporting. Um, so I think we can do some work looking at both trends in reporting of incidents over time and variations, and we can standardise for size of hospital in, in some way. So I think w we ought to do that. Also, talking particularly to junior doctors about reporting of incidents, um, I, I think we need to look at what the barriers and incentives are. Just to give a very practical one, uh, which I, I mentioned actually to Norman Williams yesterday, um, on some hospitals' uh, reporting systems, if you get halfway through reporting and you're called off because you're, you're called to an urgent case, it disappears again so and you can't save it until you've completed it now that is a strong disincentive to reporting now so we we, we need to find ways of getting <coughs> getting around that uh, equally i have heard in some trusts that people are more in favour of reporting when they can see that it's a system failure than when they see it as an individual failure. But we need to know both if we're going to learn from them. So I do think we need to, to learn from uh, particularly junior doctors who are doing a lot of the reporting and from, and from nurses as well um, about what are the barriers and incentives. Um, I mean, I agree with David. I think that um, you know, we should um, look at having um, a statutory duty to, to report m moderate concerns. Um, I mean, I, I wondered if we also had a role in, in uh, as well as looking at why people do or don't report, but actually build that into how we inspect. You know, because if we're if there are um, trusts that are under-reporting, that potentially should count against them. You know, and we could also link it into this uh, holy grail of the sort of just culture where we kind of praise people, we should be sort of praising people who um, report incidents, you know, and, and um, being harder on people who, who don't report. Um, I mean, I think it will take a while to get there, but I think, um, you know, we have a good opportunity now to, to at least try to um, put in some kind of building blocks and, and show a bit of leadership around this. Yep. Sorry, so I won't rehearse the Health Watch England position because David's reported it absolutely correctly, but I just, I just think it's important for us here to be able to take a view about, as David suggested, um, what's um, uh, right for, for, for patients and users of, of service um, uh, and then think about and then how do we manage that in terms of uh, the work that we need to do. And, and I don't think there can be any argument, really, that given what's happened in, over the recent past, what's become evident over the recent past, that what's right for the users of service is that they are owed a duty of candour. And it can't just apply to situations in which there's a death. It must apply in situations to 
which, in which there's serious harm. I mean, that's a, that's a kind of a, 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 a nonsense otherwise. And if you're in that situation, what the duty of candor means is you, you get to know what's happened in an honest and, and, and undefensive manner. And that's, that's, that's the primary purpose of, uh, of this, as Francis devised it. And, um, and I think we have to kind of keep that very much in our minds. And it's very difficult to gainsay that. Um, what I, what I recognise, however, is that that then creates the conditions in which there's a huge amount um, more that gets both reported, and then there's a big dilemma about well, what do we do with it all? And you know, we have um, certainly discussed amongst ourselves, I think, in in, in other uh, situations, you know, whether whether we, for instance, uh, investigate. Uh, uh, these the, the, these uh, um, uh, reports and and if so, which ones we report? And it seems to me it's perfect. We, we investigate. It seems to me it's perfectly uh, acceptable for us to make some different decisions about which we investigate and how we manage all of these, um, rather than saying we have to apply the same treatment to all all 100,000 100, or whatever number it turns out to be. So I, I just think thinking about what's right for users and then how do we manage it is an important way of thinking about it. It seems to me what, what this is about in sort of common parlance is actually uh, active and passive cover-ups. Um, uh, and that, uh, I, and I think there is a, there's a sense of quite correct outrage at the active cover-up where, uh, uh, where what usually, what has, what has happened in recent years is an error is made, which is, a, which is bad, and then the active cover-up is much worse than the error. And I think as far as the public's concerned, uh, uh, finding a way of uh, this duty of candour is one of the ways in which we're trying to say doing that is, is wronger than having the error in the first place. Right? And, uh, because actually the public lose complete trust in everything. Um, so the active cover-up, I think, is... But then I think that you know, a passive cover-up is we, we, we didn't know we had to do anything to report this. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're moving into changing a culture. And that is a much longer term thing, but as important, um, where people, where the sorts of discussions we've had around this are, you know, some parts of the profession are surprised that they have to do this rather than actually seeing it as a normal part of what they do. <coughs> um, uh, so I actually think in, in, short, in a short term, the public need to know that we are going to, we and the and everybody is going to be tough around people who actively cover up, and that that is going to be part of a cultural change which says it's, it's normal to actually investigate your own mistakes uh, and, to, uh, and, to, and to change the culture for that to be a part of it. I think that's a longer-term thing. Um, I think there, there is a small danger here in talking about a duty of candour and a duty of reporting as if they are the same thing. Uh, I, it's hard to imagine, I, mean, I think most people understand the duty of candour as being a requirement to be open uh, whenever you're asked and perhaps to be open even before you're asked. Um, and it's hard to see why, how that very important principle might have some sort of cut-off. So yes, candour is very important in some circumstances. I don't think that's at all sustainable, so we can't, I don't think we can support that view uh, at all. Where the flexibility arises is in, is in what the consequences of that might be. Uh, it seems to me that, um, that reporting to CQC and how CQC then responds to incidents is where flexibility might, might lie. Surely there are some incidents that need to be reported, others that need to be recorded internally. Um, there, then there is the requirement when somebody asks a question to be fully open, but maybe the harm was of a relatively minor kind, so that takes us below the threshold that we're talking about. Of course, the candour, the requirement to be uh, for candour is still there, um, but the, f the flexibility means that the response of the organisation is slightly, slightly different. It's a more responsive one to the individuals who's asking questions. I don't incidentally think it's sustainable to have a different requirement on individuals from the one that you have on the organisation as a whole, because they are working in the organisation and on speaking on behalf of the care of, that was provided by it. So I just cannot see that that, that can work. So my, my suggestion is that we, the duty of candour is universal. Um, but there is significant flexibility in how that plays out according to the severity of the, of the incident, whether that from severe and death right down to the more minor incidents. Sorry, just a quick question. In the case of primary care, is the duty of candour applying to the organisation practice 
or is it just applying to the is are we going down the professional route for general practitioners and um, a second point is that I just noticed I mean all of this is very cute oriented isn't it with David Dalton and surgeons and all the rest um, I noticed that um, and I noticed that NHS England recently published a serious incidents by acute trust um, mostly wrong site surgery or retained um, foreign body post-surgery there hasn't yet been anything on primary care so a question of scope of primary does this how far does this reach to primary care and secondly if so, does it refer to the organisation of primary care? Or the so um, it was amended in the House of Lords and it refers to all healthcare organisations, so it would be at the level of the practice. Is there much data on serious and untoward incidents in general practice? Um, not that I'm aware of, and reporting is, like Mike said about hospitals, is, is variable and very few. Uh, incidents are reported and um, and then there's the second theme so there's the practice as the unit but then there's the professional responsibility in addition to that and of course practices vary in size from one single doctor um, through to very very large with hundreds of doctors so it's one of the issues I think which is why we need some time to think through this and how it works and what our responsibilities are and then Kay's um, point is a, is a very important one about how we then use that information um, when we're looking for intelligent monitoring and visiting the practices. And uh, we'd also be looking, for example, in general medical practice about how the practices learn from their significant events. And some of the practices we visited recently do no significant event analysis let alone report things up the chain uh, as we're discussing now. So I think there's a cultural shift as well as, as this. And, and Lewis uh, raises some very important points which are applicable to general medical practice as well. Good, thanks very much. I think we're very clear then, David, that, the, that um, we support Robert Francis' recommendations on this. How we use this information um, is, is, an, is the next issue. And, and I think that the point that Paul makes about underreporting or covering up is often more important than the, than the original error. So how, but how we use this information, both in primary practice, in social care, and in acute care, is we need to think about very carefully. But we are absolutely on the side of people who want to be honest and open about what's going on in hospitals and elsewhere. OK. I can assure people we are already using it, yeah. but we can get better at using it as well. Yeah, OK. Um, so the rest of the report, um, in six, I'm just updating you on the fact that um, the Chief Medical Officer has written out uh, following some comments the CPS made in relation to doctors working with um, uh, uh, women who have terminations of pregnancies about the guidelines that need to be followed and as a consequence of that is we're reviewing our guidance uh, in relation to that and that follows an earlier piece of work that CQC was asked to undertake in the earlier part of 2012 uh, on looking at termination of pregnancies so we just wanted to flag that this was important work uh, coming. The remainder of the report I'm um, uh, Dr Bill Kirkup's uh, investigation into uh, um, University Hospital Morecambe has now begun. He's begun to take evidence from families and um, in seven I'm just providing an update linked to that. The Parliamentary and Health Ombudsman uh, published a report uh, last week into the circumstances of three uh, uh, families uh, who had complained following uh, the services that they received at Morecambe Bay. And as a consequence of that, um, Julie, Dame Julie Mellors is recommending that there's a separation between the supervisory oversight of uh, midwives and the uh, professional regulation of midwives. Those two things to date have been actually uh, been, uh, conflated together at a regional level in the SHAs. And what she's saying is that there's a clear conflict here and is recommending that that's um, separated out. Uh, in nine, uh, I'm just drawing the board's attention to some work which um, colleagues have been undertaking, working with a range of organisations and the Department of Health on a concordat around uh, supporting crisis care 
uh, in mental health. This is largely led by Norman Lamb, the Minister for Care Services. We've been asked um, uh, to carry out a thematic study, and that's now in our plan on looking at um, emergency and urgent care in mental health, and that will uh, be taken forward uh, over the next year, um, which will be our contribution to this Concordat, but it really is an agreement across a range of agencies to work to improve the quality of uh, crisis care. Uh, for people with mental health problems. At 10, um, you've already referred to this, uh, David, um, we um, agreed uh, to uh, write to Stephen Dorrell as chair of the Health Select Committee in relation to uh, the, uh, the circumstances where we've got um, compromise agreements and non-disparagement provision, uh, reinforcing to where those agreements exist, that there's no uh, uh, way that we want to prevent anybody from raising legitimate concerns that they believe to be in the public interest in relation to that. Those letters have now been sent um, to 19 people. We've also written to six individuals where there are employment tribunal settlements um, and confirmed that they also are not prevented from raising legitimate issues. Uh, in terms of appointments, um, uh, Mike, Steve, Hillary, and myself met um, last week and the previous week and interviewed 11 candidates uh, for the positions of the four deputy chief inspectors uh, working to Mike. I had hoped we'd have concluded that process by this morning. Uh, we're still in the process of doing due diligence. Not all the individuals have told their employers um, that they've been offered and are accepting a job. So in public session, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say anything, but that's in progress. Um, we'll complete the due diligence this side of Christmas, but I think it's probably the other side of the Christmas New Year holiday before we'll make any public announcements on that, just so we can sequence this with the individuals uh, affected um, and uh, their organisations. So. Um, uh, I think we were delighted with the candidacies that we were able to consider and um, uh, I think we're very, very pleased with the uh, offers that we've been uh, able to make to people uh, as we go forward. I think both um, Steve and Andrea, when they do their updates, will update more generally about uh, where we are on appointments on Chief Inspectors, David. So, thank you. Chairman, thank you very much. Yes, an oral update. I'll start with uh, acute hospitals. Um, as everybody here knows, I think uh, there were 18 acute trusts in the first wave of the programme, six that we thought were high risk, six we thought were low risk, six that we thought were intermediate. Uh, the inspection started on the 16th of September, so it's just under uh, three months ago. I'm very pleased to report that all 18 planned site visits have now been completed. Um, we've held quality summits for the first eight of those 18, um, and uh, four of the reports are already in the public domain. The next four will be in the public domain from this afternoon, so I can't uh, formally talk about, about them uh, specifically at this stage. Uh, but I can give some general comments on all 18 um, <coughs> without naming names. Um, as everybody knows, uh, it's been a three-phase programme, uh, the pre-inspection or preparation phase, in the inspection phase, um, and then the report writing and quality summit. Um, it was based on a combination of what we have been doing here previously at CQC and what um, Bruce Keogh had been doing for his review of high mortality trusts. Um, what I would say is that we have been making modifications to the process as we've gone along. We've done them in groups of four or five, and after each group we've taken the time to try and improve the process, and then there will be further uh, significant improvements between uh, this wave and the, the next wave, which is uh, in January. So, uh, just to give examples, we, we now ask the Chief Executive of the Provider Trust to give us a presentation, but we do that during our training day because it, it starts getting the team really familiarised with the trust that they're going to be um, uh, inspecting. It also gives us the opportunity, um, or it gives the trust the opportunity to say what the context is, what they think they're doing well, but also what challenges they face. And obviously, we want to see if they know about the challenges they face um, alongside what we then find. We've also 
defined our sub teams more carefully so the team that goes into A&E, the team that goes into medical wards or into maternity and paediatrics etc. Um, and I think a very important part of this is th that we are trying to get people to um, identify both the positive and the negative uh, factors and I think this is quite a change uh, in the way um, that we're, we're doing things, emphasising what is good as well as what's not so good. Um, we're still learning, we're still working with the King's Fund, for example, on how we um, measure the well-led domain, but I think we've already made good progress on that. And I think also to say, in these 18 trusts, we've had some very, very large trusts. Um, Bart's Health, Heart of England, Foundation Trust, Nottingham University Hospitals Trust. Um, and so these are, I don't think inspections of this size and complexity have been done before because all of the Keogh Trusts happen to be uh, rather smaller. And again, uh, we are learning how best to, to do that. Um, what we have shown, I think, is that the, the process is deliverable. Um, and despite very tight timescales, we have recruited uh, the people we need, the very senior figures to be the chairs, the team leaders, uh, the clinicians, the experts by experience, and the CQC inspectors. Um, that has been tight simply because of the pace that we've been doing it at. Uh, I think in future, if we can give ourselves a longer interval between identifying the trust that we're going to go into and the actual site visit, that will get considerably easier. I think in terms of what we have found, um, first of all, I think it is very important to say we have found a lot of very, very good care. Um, and the really compassionate care being delivered by staff, actually in every single one of the 18 trusts we've been into, uh, that's been reported by uh, the inspection teams and I've witnessed it my, myself. Um, we have seen some trusts that are really delivering excellent care across a whole range of, of, of services um, and, and, and across all the core services that we are looking at. Um, that also means that we've seen some that are not doing that. But I think what that does tell us is that our inspection programme really can tell the difference between the, the, the different le levels of, of quality and the different outcomes. But possibly just as important as that is that within an individual trust, we can detect variation. So it is quite possible to see a trust that um, has a good maternity service, but not such a good A&E service, or vice versa. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is, is, is quite powerful, because we know that from a public perspective, they obviously want to know about the service that they are um, most likely to, to, to want and need. Um, I think at a third level of specificity, if you like, we have also seen that there are some uh, individual services, and this particularly, I think, applies to, to the medical care, um, where across 10, 15 wards in a, in a trust, most of them may actually be delivering uh, good care, but there may be one or two wards that are really off the pace. Um, now, clearly, what one of the things that matters here is, does the trust know that in, in advance, and what are they doing about it, and how quickly uh, can they um, put that back? And we um, will uh, specifically report on those wars where, where we see them. Um, and equally, we are seeing some that, although they've got a long journey to go before they're delivering services that we would consider good, are, are un undoubtedly improving. So. Um, Looking to the future, um, we've now got a brief interval before wave two commences in mid-January, um, and we will use that time to uh, improve our processes, uh, better data packs, we're giving more training to our own CQC staff, um, we will be bringing in more information from national clinical audits, because actually they are one of the best ways of d deciding how effective the care is and how that compares with other trusts. Um, we're also looking at whether we can vary the, the, the time and location of patient listening events. Is it always best to do these in the evening or should we be doing some of them in, during the daytime? So, uh, and, and the report writing, we're still at quite an early phase of the report writing, if I'm, if I'm honest. We are learning with each report that we write. And the more that we can have a standardised template, um, and actually that we can populate the, the reports from the data packs, um, that will make um, things easier. 
Um, we've established an acute advisory group now. It's had its first meeting. That's been very valuable, getting feedback from Royal Colleges, from other partner agencies, Health Watch, um, so that we can really make sure that we are doing this with support of all those, those agencies. We will be publishing a handbook in January, um, which will give guidance to providers about what we're expecting and should be helpful for them. Um, and also, at the end of the, the, the process for Wave 1, which by the time we get through all the reports is at the end of January or early February, uh, we will then be uh, reporting on the first three shadow uh, ratings. Um, and so I think all of that um, is pointing in the right direction. Um, alongside that, we I reported last month on the work that we're doing on mental health and community services. There's not a lot new to say about that, except that we are on track. Uh, we have now published the signposting document uh, for mental health. Um, we will imminently be doing the same for community health services, um, and their, pr their first uh, inspections start in mid-January as well, on 20th of January, uh, when we're going into Central Essex and Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership Trust. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Anyone like to make any observations? Uh, Mike, Michael, would it... Well, I, I've read all four reports, and I do think they're excellent. So, you know, if they're going to be improved, they're going to be even better than the current ones. I, I found them, you know, very well structured, you know, extremely informative. I think they do, as it happens, we'll come on to later, raise, you know, very significant issues about the judgment that uh, will go into the rating. But, but I have to say, I, I thought these reports were absolutely first class. So. The key, the key issue being that they do really get under the skin of the hospital so that we really do have confidence that we have got it. Yes. I, I thought the, sorry, just one other point, this point about structure. You know, I, I think the summary is very good, but I, I thought what was very effective is, first of all, you know, the first section of each report is by domain and the second section is by service, and I thought that worked very well because the by domain section gave you um, a thorough overview of the hospital and then by service obviously took you to another level of detail and I think when you combine the two you know and then you know you came to the end of the report although it was also in the summary the actions the hospitals must take and uh, examples of good practice, although, you know, the, the actions that must be taken clearly were the most important part of the findings. I thought they all tied together extremely well, so, um, and they were, to take Mike's point, very well written. Um, but I think you do now have something very close to an excellent template. Um, so congratulations to all involved. Yes, uh, and I agree with that, and the... Um uh, I think what that means is that we now have a, uh, a technique which we can trust to discriminate. Um, and, and for me, this is probably the most important, most important outcome of it, um, uh, because one of, the, one of the things I think the CQC is doing has to do for the public is to demonstrate and persuade the level of variation that we know exists within a system uh, and to ensure that what we're talking about gets that message across. And I think, as you said in your introduction, there's three different sorts of variation between institutions, within institutions, and within bits of the institution. Um, and, and in reading the four reports, they, they are persuasive in coming up with that. Um, uh, and then the next thing is what happens. Um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, the, it seems to be all of those things, because, uh, because of discrimination, because of, sorry, um, uh, variation within, uh, an outstanding hospital has to improve um, because there'll be something within. So in a sense, we, we, are, we are looking, going back on every, to everybody, um, uh, or, you know, if not physically going back, you know, everybody's under review because of the importance of improvement. Um, and generally, uh, over the last three months, so it was about three months ago after the Keogh reviews when, um, 
when the first hospitals were put into special measures and no one knew what it was. Um, um, for the, the day it happened, no one knew what it was. And actually, the interesting thing is now, I think they do. I actually think within three months, people have recognised that actually you can have a very bad report and be left in charge of the outcome or have a very bad report and lose your autonomy because you actually have special measures. And I think, so I actually think uh, there is a, there's a recognition of a differentiated set of outcomes. Now, what happens then after that, I, you know, it's early days on that, but uh, so I think the categories that you end up in are beginning to mean something in, in, the, in the service. Uh, thanks. The, the, um, one of the things we've talked about at previous meetings is how we uh, ensure that the highest ratings go to organisations which can demonstrate that they provide the best care to the people who are often disadvantaged in the health system. And, and that might be disadvantaged by their clinical condition, so people with dementia or learning disability. It might be because of settings which are historically rather poor, such as the, uh, the way emergency departments provide for people who have self-harmed, for example. Um, or it might be people who are socially on the margins, homeless people, uh, people from certain ethnic minorities, people whose first language is not English. But there's a whole set of people who, who sometimes don't get the best that the health service can uh, generally provide. And we want to, that to be reflected. Now, I just wanted whether, Mike, you could say something about how easy it has been to pick up those issues. Well, I suppose my starting point would be to say I think we can do considerably better than we have done. Um, and I think it's a question of uh, providing our inspection teams with the right prompts and getting the different parts of the teams often to look at specific different groups of, of vulnerable patients. Uh, so, for example, on the medical wards, we will always look at the care of the elderly, which always includes people with dementia, and we will ask specific questions there. I think... It, we are in the in the A and E department. We're clearly going to be asking about what mental health support there is in the A and E department. Um, are we doing it as well as we could and as systematically as we could yet? I don't think we are, um, but I think that is part of the reason why um, we needed this, this first wave as a learning phase, and I think that, that's the sort of thing that we are trying to build on for wave two. We've, um, in our inspections, we have to set priorities about um, where to go and look and what to probe, and that's based on a whole set of information that we've got in advance, under so understood that. But where we, because we can't be everywhere all the time in these hospitals, and where we have, in a sense, deprioritised some areas because we're not so worried about them, perhaps, how confident are we that if we haven't been to look at those areas, that actually um, they're okay. Uh, have we done any testing to just check that? Thanks. I think the second half of your question, probably, have we done any testing? The answer is no. Uh, I think that the process does allow for us to hear from a lot of different angles that would point us towards different services. So in one of the hospitals we've been into, we did pick up concerns about the ophthalmology outpatient department. And so we went and looked at that ophthalmology outpatient department. That came through uh, complaints. The trust knew about it themselves. We heard about it from staff. So I think b because we look from multiple angles, we will pick up a lot of those things. And equally at the, the listening event, I think in one place we heard concerns about vascular services. So we went and looked at vascular services. I don't think unless we go to every single department of every single hospital, I can ever give assurance um, that we won't miss things. I think our process minimises the risk of that, but does not eliminate it. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, thanks for the, for the report. I mean, one thing that I would like to be able to sort of um, uh, say um, eventually is, is to sort of answer the question about, you know, what, what what difference have we made? And I think particularly, um, you know, o over time, um, you know, we, we can maybe look at, potent, you know, sort of tangible improvements, you know, based on the inspection. And obviously that's very good um, sort of evidence of, of the, the, the sort of impact we've had. Um, so it would be useful to know that. But also sort of over, over time, I mean, there inevitably will be, for example, unintended consequences. That's sort of inevitable. 
um, and um, and also the, the sort of also the value for money element, which um, we will at some point be challenged with. Um, so it's yeah, what what you know, it's not a single answer to this, but but in time to be able to say um, you know quite clearly the difference that that we've made um, would be something I'd be looking for. And so will I, um, undoubtedly. Um, I think we will probably, within a few months, get some uh, steers about, if you like, the quick wins that we've had. I, th there are things that people have put right um, already. Um, I can't give you a list of those yet, but I think we should we should try and compile a list of of the things where where trusts have said, yep, in response to that, within. A month, within two months, we we did the following things because I think that would be would be valuable. Um, I've got one ridiculous one I can tell you about. A porter came to us and said that a door that he'd been pushing patients through for two years had been squeaking for for those two years. I can assure you that had been sorted before the end of uh, our, our visit. Um, but um, th there are there are more impressive changes than that. Uh, but we were, I think probably best for us to try and gather those t t together. Um, value for money. Um, that will be for, uh, we will need to reflect on what the costs are and the value will be in how much improvement it does help to drive. Um, I can tell you that at one of the trusts we've been into, uh, the chief executive remarked that this was the best free consultancy he had ever had. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Just, can I just, just finish with just two points. Some inspections are better than others, inevitably. Um, because the people on the team will be better, they'll handle it better. In terms of training up inspectors, um, is that that's something I just would like to think that we're doing. The second thing is that we're doing quite a lot of feedback sessions from trusts that have been inspected during January and February. And um, David and I are doing some at, at a level, and Mike, I know you're doing it with, I think, all the trusts that you've, been, you've inspected. Um, if anyone you know, from the board would like to sort of sit in on those, they'd be very welcome to do that, I'm sure. That's, but just um, on that, just training up inspectors, Mike. No, uh, undoubtedly, we need um, more training and better training for, for people going on these inspections. Again, it's partly been the, the pace that we've been working at that has not meant that that's ideal. But equally, we now know more about the process ourselves and we, we know what we really want to, the training to include. And, and I think um, a key group are our own staff. Um, that this is a very different process. We are expecting different things of, of them. We uh, particularly want them to look at what is good in this. And so we need to give them the training in what to look at as, as what is good. So that, that is something that uh, we are we have put in place a one-day training program for the people who will be inspectors uh, in the next wave um, that will start in early January. So we're taking that seriously. Will that be enough? No, it won't. Um, but it will be a, a good starting point. And in terms of the external people, um, we have already selected, because we didn't have time to do more training, we have selected people who have done similar peer review inspections uh, for other organisations. Um, and But we do build in some training to the so-called day naught of our programme, in other words, when they're on site, but before they go and inspect the, the hospital. But we can do bit more and we do better. Thanks very much for that. I know you've been under tremendous pressure over the last three months. I think you've done a fantastic job getting it going. So, well, you know, well done. Um, Andrea. Thank you um, very much. And um, just to bring the board up to date with some of the things that we're uh, taking forward in the adult social care arena. Uh, as I did in the last meeting, I've set the report against the five priorities that we set out in a fresh start for the regulation and inspection of adult social care so that you could see how we're delivering on those priorities. On developing the new regulatory approach, uh, we are doing a lot of work uh, at the moment looking at how we take the five key questions and how they will apply in the different circumstances of adult social care, not least because um, it's different to um, uh, 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 acute services, but it's also different within itself between residential care, domiciliary care, hospice services that we'll be responsible for, but also in the range uh, uh, and heterogeneity uh, of the sector. So it's a challenging task to try and make sure that we can 
can have um, a, a good line of inquiry which is supportive to the inspections that we're going to undertake, but it's not war and peace um, in terms of uh, uh, burdening uh, our inspectors and our experts by experience um, with, uh, with so much guidance that they can't get through it. So, so it's trying to, trying to balance those things out um, and we're doing that work uh, now which will be building us through to consultation in the spring and our first wave of uh, the new uh, approach in, in adult social care um, from April onwards. Developing the rating system obviously comes out of that and, um, and it'd be, you know, it's going to be very useful to take the experience that Mike has already had of looking at how um, the, the uh, assessments that the inspection teams um, will make uh, how that will ap apply in adult social care, which again is different in terms of the complexity, but uh, we also need to be thinking about uh, how we how we look at this from a corporate provider's point of view to a very small domiciliary care agency point of view, ensuring that we're still consistent across the board so that people can have confidence in that, but that we're recognising and acknowledging the different sources of data that we've got there. Working with the Department of Health on the uh, move towards the monitoring of the finances of some of the uh, corporate providers and we had our second advisory uh, group uh, since the last meeting with some uh, key providers in the room and that was extremely helpful actually in kind of getting through some of the difficult issues there. Supporting our staff to deliver, uh, one aspect of that is engaging our staff in the development of the approach. And here we've got a slight um, uh, advantage compared to, to Mike, which is that we're obviously developing the approach um, now rather than developing at the same time as doing it. So we are being able to involve uh, inspectors and people um, uh, in some of the supporting uh, teams in the development of the new approach so that actually we're kind of building up the learning from within as well as in the future uh, putting that into the training that we'll take through the academy once we're, we're clear about what tr what training needs there are and um, we've got an internal co-production group which met last week and um, which is going through the key lines of the lines of inquiry um, and and how we would take that forward the other thing that I'd say is about the uh, structure and how we're progressing with that. I've um, asked Sue Howard and Debbie Westhead, uh, who are two of our heads of regional compliance, to work with me on trying to move from the overarching modelling that we've done for that and actually practically what is that going to mean uh, for adult social care in the structures from the 1st of April so that uh, we can make sure that we're providing providing staff with the information that they need to make the decisions um, about which of the inspectorates um, uh, they might wish to, uh, to work in in the future, but also so that we can uh, make sure that we're thinking through with Steve and with Mike how we're going to handle the um, a liaison at a local level uh, in terms of the different sectors. So, so there's a lot of kind of detailed work that we need to be doing there. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, come January I'll have some Deputy Chief Inspectors to help me in that task as well. So we're progressing with the uh, recruitment uh, of those posts. Uh, as you know, we'll have four Deputy Chief Inspectors uh, in the Adult Social Care Directorate, each of them responsible for um, the same regional patches that we've got at the moment but also expecting them to take on some national roles um, specifically around either market oversight or uh, registration and um, a, 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 a better lead on our engagement with our corporate providers. So, um, as I say, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get those people um, identified um, in, in January. And then finally, just trying to make sure that we're being transparent and open about everything that we're doing, um, both in um, going out and propagating the adult social care gospel on behalf of the Care Quality Commission as often as I possibly can, and, um, uh, and, and sharing that information through the weekly blog that we're putting on the internet and the intranet. So happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Andrea. Lewis. Andrew, I, th I think this is great work. I really, I do think it's uh, you, you have such a difficult and diverse area to uh, uh, apply these uh, principles to. I think this is a really important piece of work. And could I though just ask you um, uh, about the thing that concerned me that I raised? Uh, I'm sorry for raising it by email 
in between meetings, but uh, I, um, I wanted to just check with you today so that it's possible to, to record what, what, uh, um, what we might, CQC might be doing about this issue. And this is the problem of uh, abuse and serious neglect in uh, residential settings, uh, primarily residential settings. Um, and what, one of the things that I've been most uh, surprised by, I suppose, despite having worked in services throughout my career, uh, it, of a number of cases that are coming through where CQC has taken some sort of enforcement action against an individual or a care home uh, because of the abuse or the serious neglect of residents. Um, now, I'm not surprised that that happens, but the number of times it's happening has surprised me. Um, and uh, it raises a number of points about um, uh, the, the, peop the appointment of people who are the perpetrators, um, about organisational oversight, uh, it raises questions about the people who are working alongside the perpetrators um, and, their, and their role. Um, and for me, it raises, it's the, the question then is what, um, at a time when I understand we are putting into together an entirely new inspection system, what additional work we might do on prevention. And I suppose I've got in mind a model here, which is what happened after Winterbourne View was exposed uh, and the work that took place there um, on uh, identifying before, before any evidence of uh, abuse was known, uh, identifying places that could be at risk because of their circumstances, because of their geographical location, their clientele and so on, um, and following up um, in some way with them um, the risks that people could be, could be under. Um, and uh, the Winterbourne View work is reaching a sort of Sort of conclusion, I suppose, over the next few months, as I understand it. And so I, I am wondering whether there is an equivalent piece of work which might uh, apply more broadly, not just to the learning disability people who are the, uh, the subject of the Winterbourne View, post-Winterbourne View work, um, but talking now about more broadly about residents of care homes who might be equivalently vulnerable. Thank you very much, Lewis, and, and, and thank you very much for raising it in between the uh, meeting with me as well. I think the, the, the reassurance that I can give you is that this is a critical part of what we're doing in the development of the new regulatory approach um, on, on two levels, I think, which are really important. The first is, what's the, in, what is intelligent monitoring for adult social care? You know, where do we get the information and the insight to identify the risks um, that would uh, determine our um, in, uh, inspection practice? And I think that we do not have um, in, in adult social care the breadth and the depth of the data that is available in, a, in acute hospitals. So the risk rating that uh, uh, Mike was able to produce a few weeks ago, 150 data items behind each of those hospitals, we are unlikely ever to have that amount of information consistently collected across the 24-odd thousand um, uh, locations that we're regulating in adult social care. So we need to be thinking about um, how how do we actually get insight in different ways? So that's looking at what some of the corporate providers are already doing because they are actually um, uh, uh, interested in this as well and creating their own quality assurance mechanisms. So how do we how do we make sure that we're sharing data and information um, appropriately there? How do we ensure that we're sharing um, uh, information and people are sharing with us from local authorities about what's happening at a local level? And it's a particular aspect of what we need to be doing in terms of working better with local authorities to reduce duplicates but also to enhance um, information sharing. And, and thirdly, to be looking at what's, what information can we gain from the local groups, and we were talking about this only this morning in the launch of our statement of involvement about the work that we'll be doing with Local Health Watch and others um, to ensure that we're, get, we're picking up that insight and building that into our intelligent monitoring. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it then is what um, are we doing around our inspection practice and uh, uh, looking at those things that actually, as you quite rightly say, would be warning signals uh, in terms of um, the potential for abuse. And, and here, I, I think we're helped by uh, something that I was involved in last week, which was the launch of a, a summary report um, which had been commissioned by Comet Relief and the Department of Health, looking at the prevention um, uh, of abuse and neglect um, of uh, older, 
people in institutional settings. So actually it applies to hospitals as well as care homes. And one of the really, really important things that that research drew out for us was the relationship between how staff are treated and how that impacts on the way um, that uh, uh, residents are treated. And you know, it's not rocket science, really, <laughs> but actually it's really helpful in terms of saying these are some of the things that we need to look at as markers of a good quality service. So um, how uh, are, are, are staff recruited? How do we ensure that they've got, much as we were talking about fit and proper persons at a directorate level, how do we make sure that we're recruiting people who've got the values and display the behaviours that we need to have um, in the services um, that we're regulating? How are they trained? And how are they appropriately supported? Um, and those are questions that I think that we need to be looking at when we're actually doing the inspections so that we can get at the heart of what it is that actually um, helps to prevent those situations as opposed to coming in and picking up the pieces afterwards. And then I think the other things that we can do to help around this is identify the areas of good practice um, because they do exist. Um, and so our ability to rate um, uh, uh, on this basis in the future, I think will uh, give us greater confidence in being able to share good practice and also to point people to um, the uh, resources that are available to them to improve practice. So things like the adult, so uh, adult safeguarding resources that Social Care Institute for Excellence launched earlier this year as an example. So there's a variety of things that we can do and I think that we can build that in to the new approach that we're taking. That was an excellent response. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Okay, and then Jennifer, then we must move on, I think. Um, I mean, I, I um, obviously agree that we should be looking at prevention, um, but I think it probably needs more more than that that's just sort of one one element of it and i think um you know this this sort of uh, abuse um has been going on for years and years and we're just sort of more aware of it now and it probably will you know because people are potentially vulnerable um for example if they have sort of dementia or learning disability it does add to their risk if you like of, of abuse and and I, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that, that when we have people that contact us with concerns, it, it's more often than not f from a social care setting. And I, and I just wondered, you know, going forward, the extent to which we should either continue or encourage people to come to us with um, concerns, whistleblowing concerns, because it seems that... that um, that is a really important. It's at the moment. It's still a really important way of of um, getting getting to concerns. You know, if if it, we need, for example, a relative or a a staff, a member of staff, to actually say, look, abuse is is, is happening. You know, that's in a way a really important way of identifying it. And I just wondered if we are going to sort of continue to promote that. Uh, you know, to encourage people to to, to contact us with, with concern. Yeah. The, the short answer, given I, that I gave such a long answer f to the last question, um, is is yes. And and you're absolutely right. We get uh, uh, information in a variety of different ways, uh, both from uh, relatives, but also from other professionals uh, who are visiting um, services or uh, visiting people at home and picking up on, on, on those signs. And we do need to take those uh, into consideration. And that's part and parcel, I think, of why we have to think about the insight that we gain about adult social care services, not just data monitoring, because those things are really important too. It's just a quick question. The wave one of inspections for social care and indeed for primary care, is the principle going to be the similar to the acute sector, that there will be high risk, medium risk, low risk, or at least perceived high or medium low risk, and, and that's going to be part of wave one? Um, not exactly, because as we, well, certainly not from my point of view, Steve may want, want, to, want to answer uh, on the GP uh, side of things, because we don't have sufficiently, you know, we've not got a sufficiently well-developed uh, assessment of that level of risk. Um, so, so I think that what we're looking at in terms of 
trying to work out what are the places that we should be going into in wave one is the different types of service and the different nature of those services because actually the, the, the risk is really well spread out. I mean, Kay's absolutely right. An awful lot of the people that we're providing service to in adult social care um, are vulnerable, are at risk, and um, because of the nature uh, 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 of the situation that they're living in. So, so we're not looking at it on that basis, but we're looking to make sure in the first wave that we learn as much as we possibly can about how we apply the five questions, our lines of inquiry, how we run the inspection in the various different settings. Settings, and I think that that will give us a variety of different um, uh, levels of risk that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to flush out, and it'll be part of our learning process. But, I, you know, Paul can speak from the intelligent monitoring point of view, but we would not be confident to be able to say this is high risk and this is low risk at the moment. Um, although, um, don't we know about the registered managers? That is quite high risk, isn't it, as a... Yes, we do, and, and that's something that, as you know, we're tackling at the moment uh, in terms of, and, and, and actually, it's one of those things, the question that we were asking earlier is, that are we making a difference? And we certainly know that uh, in encouraging people or letting people know that we were going to um, uh, be taking forward our ability to issue fixed penalty notices around registered managers, people are pretty rapidly getting that sorted out. But yes, you're right, that's that's one indicator um, of, of uh, because we know that there are higher rates of non compliance where we don't have a registered manager and certainly you know, but we would be expecting to pick some of those up in, in the first wave well, thank Andrew thank you very much I think maybe Paul we could ask you and Andrew to come back to the board with what we do have when it comes to intelligent monitoring of adult social care at a future meeting would that be all right um, I think we should move on to Steve uh, Steve has had a, you had a tough week Steve I think it will be fair to say I think you've done it fantastically well and it's very hard when you know you're exposing um, issues and difficulties in a profession of, to which you are so massively committed. But I think you've done it really well, and you've got we're totally behind you. So well done. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's been interesting times, um, uh, as I knew it would be when I was uh, hired for this this role. Um, uh, I mean, I'm doing this role on behalf of patients and the public, and I think that has to be very clear in everything we do. This is the first time that general medical practice in England has been regulated. And uh, inevitably, as I predicted, um, the focus would be on the very small number of practices which are very unacceptable. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that because I, uh, there is a... a um, Part of the answer for Jennifer on intelligent monitoring is very similar to, to how Andrea responded, in that we're at the start of a journey, and um, working with Paul and his colleagues, uh, we need to develop, uh, and very quickly, um, a robust intelligent monitoring system, which will be used in the first wave um, of visits, which will start uh, during April. Um, the current uh, visits, uh, the inspections, um, the, most of those are targeted. And uh, in, in response to Kay's, uh, I think it was a question earlier on about, uh, about whistleblowers and uh, information, part of our intelligent monitoring system has to be to respond, probably for the first time across the country, to people who are whistleblowing from within organizations uh, and patient complaints and suggestions. And one of the heartening um, responses to last week's launch of our, of our signposting document and the publicity uh, has been that many people are coming forward um, from within and without practices. So one of the difficulties we're going to have, I think uh, social care at also goes very similar, in that if you have very small practices, uh, many patients feel vulnerable about complaining because in some areas that's the only GP they have access to and they feel that their future care will be compromised if they were identified. The same for, for, for members of staff. And therefore one of the things I have to do is protect the sources that we are getting that information from, which at times makes my job more difficult but that's what we will do. Um, I was delighted by uh, the uh, collective effort of staff in CQC 
helping us produce the uh, signposting document, uh, and also to reflect back onto the last board meeting, which uh, was um, challenging in a really constructive way. Uh, for example, positing a question about whether we should rate general medical practices um, against uh, the patient groups we suggested. We had a very, very good discussion uh, led by Lewis about mental health. And so we, we, in the document, you'll see that we've reflected on the debate here and we will be rating practices on how they look after patients that are elderly, long-term conditions, people of the working age, mums, babies, children, my own uh, group of, uh, of people that I'm passionate about, the very vulnerable, including people with learning disabilities, uh, and also patients who have mental health uh, conditions. And um, it was really heartening when we interviewed for, for Mike Richards' deputy roles, that when we talked about integration, we had such a positive response from the candidates with great ideas of the those that, that are gonna be offered and those who unfortunately we would love to take but can't. And so um, I think the future is, is very positive from that respect. Unfortunately, when you talk uh, about a system that I've inherited, it does focus on um, inadequate pr practices and compliance with regulations rather than looking at the good and outstanding. So one of the things that will happen as we begin wave one and onwards from April is that when we start to rate practices, uh, we will be able to celebrate good and outstanding practice. So uh, to answer Jennifer's question from earlier, uh, most of these so far have been targeted. Um, we will continue to do that up until April and onwards, and we will respond to concerns as Andrea will as they, they, as they come in. But until we really have a system of, in, uh, of, of monitoring which we can trust, <coughs> Uh, and it's not there at the moment, then inevitably um, we will have to do things in a less scientific way. But after April, the work has started and we, and we will be there. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are now working on um, the academy within CQC because we are going to have to recruit hundreds of people to deliver our, um, our inspection teams. Most uh, initially will be from existing staff, and uh, I've been heartened by uh, the roadshows and meeting with, with, with members of staff around the country, how, how really good and keen people are to get involved. But we will need to recruit from the outside, and we're having many meetings with stakeholders, uh, including people like senior examiners from the college, uh, senior educators who've been involved in inspections who want to be part of, of, of this journey. Um, I wanted to say something uh, more about out-of-hours care because uh, that was also one of our priorities. Um, we, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on how we will inspect uh, out-of-hours. Uh, our commitment is to do uh, about 28 uh, of the providers before the end of April. Uh, that's our commitment to learn, uh, to inspect, and then we're going to um, look at the remaining providers of out-of-hours not the GPs who have elected to continue the out-of-hours, but out-of-hours providers by the end of June and report. Um, we're looking back at the uh, ministerial review, the paper that I wrote with uh, Dr. David Colin Tomei under the last government to make sure that the recommendations on the systems failures that happened uh, ex uh, with the example of Cambridge and the Obani case are, have been addressed at a national level. And then we're going to have a look at the providers. So that come um, April, when we do start to do the first wave of CCG-based inspections of practices, we'll then start to take out of hours in as part of when we go into the localities. Uh, and we can also then, through our integrated approach and theme review, start to look at how urgent care is provided, because it's the handoffs between services where, where patients are, are at risk. Um, that's all I actually wanted to say, because those are the two main areas of work, although you'll see in the report that we've also started to work with, with dentists and others. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, questions for Steve? Jennifer? So it's really good to have the out-of-hours looked at at the same time as the CCG area. I mean, I think that's a, a great yeah. thing to do. Um, just on the social care back on the, and the, the, the approach to risk, it, it, if it's not 
too much for the board to see. I think it would be quite u useful to see emerging thoughts about how risk is is assessed. As I cl clearly, it's in. Yeah. It is going to take a while, at least a year, or maybe more, to work out. But just to see it as it emerges, I think, would be useful. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, um, two um, different things. I mean, uh, I think um, looking at the media response on the twelfth uh, of, of December after um, Steve published uh, the initial analysis. Um, I mean, it was it was interesting. To, uh, to, to see, as this is the first time, as Steve said, that uh, GPs have been regulated, that the interest in it, first of all, uh, the recognition, again, that there's variation, um, and that uh, this was an important issue, uh, and then, um, uh, disappointingly, that the Royal College uh, didn't say there was variation. Um, uh, and this looked remarkably like the NUT in '93. Um, uh, and I'd just like to say that sooner or later, they will say there is. Uh, as spring becomes summer and more and more reports come out, they will then agree there is variation, that in the end, the public recognition of this will overcome a protective stance. Um, uh, and it'll be tricky for a few months as the, as the profession, in a sense, I think, acts in a defensive way, uh, but I think the evidence will the evidence will be there, and I think that that's important to recognise at the beginning of that, um, and it will change. Um, the second thing is this is going you know, coming back to my theme about the rhythm of of a of a report and then this is one of the few reports that actually NHS England should be responding to, because in a sense they hold the contracts, um, uh, and therefore they'll be they'll be the improvement agency. Uh, the practice themselves will be the improvement agent, but then NHS England needs to take responsibility. And if in the fullness of time there are special measures uh, uh, for practices, then actually it's NHS England that will have to be doing something about that. Uh, th thank you. If I could just respond to that. Um, um, we've had great support actually in the advisory board from both the BMA and, and the college. Um, uh, I think some of the public pronouncements, uh, I think you're right about the rhythm and how things will move forward. Uh, this is the first time that systematically we've looked at quality of care in general medical practice across England. Um, I'm saddened by some of the individual responses, and, and, but I've been consistent when I was leading the Royal College uh, about um, unacceptable variation and we needed to address it then. And I, I know uh, the chair of the college very much agrees because we, we've been meeting with her. And uh, uh, I'm actually heartened by uh, their commitment to work, to work with us. Um, as far as NHS England goes, it, it, it is quite intriguing because they have inherited um, a system from primary care trusts, which was also hugely variable, both in how it, they supported general medical practice and they monitored their contracts. Uh, you have examples of, of support, development, and um, not tolerating inadequate practice in places like Tower Hamlets. In other areas, we're picking up from the British Medical Association and others that practices haven't been supported. And in one area, um, specifically, they were worried about whether if they didn't have a practice, it was better to have a GP that they were worried about rather than no GP at all. And I think what we're now finding is that we're turning up the heat, not just on quality within practice. I hope we never see another inadequate practice. Our standards are published. Uh, we know that practices with out-of-date oxygen cylinders, you've only got to check the label. Uh, you've only got to check the temperature on a fridge. There is no excuse for any practice in this country not to have done those basic things. So if, I, if, if our teams go into practices now and, and those sort of things are exposed again, it is very, very sad. But also, um, we do need NHS England to support the practices and actually monitor the contracts as well. And I think this is a wake-up call to everyone. Unfortunately, messengers get shot occasionally. And um, uh, there you go. And uh, Lewis, very quickly, then we will uh, move well, on. Very quickly. Um, well, in that case, uh, very quickly, I, I actually thought you did a really good job, Steve, actually, uh, I must say. Um, it was a, wasn't an easy task 
um, because there was uh, um, much less interest in what you said about the widespread nature of good practice. Um, and even though you kept saying it, um, I think it kept being ignored and you were draw, dr brought back to the maggot question, which uh, I think we all remember this launch for. Um, the, um, but uh, there is a serious point here about the clinical credibility of this process, which we have to bear in mind. There's, there's no doubt that responsibility to patients and to their patients' families is absolutely the criterion by which the success of these inspections will be measured. Um, but, behind, but next in importance is the credibility in the people who, with, with the people who are delivering the service. And so I could only encourage you to keep making the point about good practice. I think Mike made a similar point about mm. ensuring that reports are, are making as much of good and excellent practice as they are of yeah. poor practice. Yeah. It may be difficult to get it across, but it's the vital message to get, get across to practitioners who feel under pressure yeah. Uh, and who maybe don't, and who do def uh, differentially pick up the negative. And the second thing is to make it clear what are the reasons for less than good ratings. Mm. Um, it was striking to me how easy it was for people to distort uh, poor ratings into rather trivial uh, observations. Mm. Um, so that, uh, oh well, you know, this was seen on the inspection, so that meant that they were rated inadequate, uh, mm. uh, for mm. needing improvement. Um, and and uh, how do you overcome that? I think being absolutely clear about what exactly was the reason why the rating was mm. less than less than good. Mm. Mm. Okay. Th thanks very much. I think um, David, you just want to just round up the sort of the reports of the three chief inspectors very quickly. Um, so I think um, behind each of them, there are teams that are working on this to produce the documents, and so I think the organisation as a whole is really demonstrating a corporate and collaborative approach to this. Um, I think all of them has referred to the people that have assisted in producing the reports, etc. So um, the other side of this internally, there's a real team effort going into this. The organisation is running very hot, people are very busy, um, and um, we need to attend to that. Um, but the fact is that people are um, uh, really working uh, to support this. I think the other thing, uh, and I think this is a space that Lewis uh, was just in really, uh, as well as our own staff behind this, David, I think the launch we had this morning of engagement with service users and then engagement across the system has been critical to helping us, not just in terms of the credibility with the service. I think your point, Paul, about changing perceptions is I think we are at that edge of uh, whether people think regulation is good or bad. I think they've now accepted we're here and that what we're trying to do is reach out and engage with them about how we can do this so that we can be the best we can be, so that people receiving services can get access to the best services. So it feels to me that it's coming together. I think Jennifer's questions um, uh, were really pertinent. I think um, Andrea's point was is that there's more data on which we can do the surveillance for acute health care. But I think we need to uh, not to emphasise what we've not got in terms of the data, but uh, to emphasise what we have got and say what we can do about that surveillance. And I think these points um, about uh, we do know something about registered managers, for instance, and the criticality, and that can flag risk. It's a smoke alarm, and similarly, Steve will have them. So I think, I think pushing into that space after... Um, at the beginning of next year, David, and bringing a report forward will help us actually talk about what it is we can do and uh, expose that, that conversation in the same way that we have on acute health care, because that surveillance, those metrics, uh, are an essential part of our new operating model, and therefore I think we need to start uh, demonstrating what we can do. The debate's about what do we do with the money we've not got, or what do we do with the 121 billion we've got, so I think we need to push into that space about what we have got and how we can move that forward, so we'll... Um, I'll take that forward in the new year. Um, Paul, briefly, please. All right. Um, so this is the October report, combines performance, finance uh, and risk. Um, if I just do the headline sense, so we're at 98 per cent of our plan for the inspections completed. We've discussed many times that uh, activity is by no means the only measure. Um, and we will look to, or well, we are changing that already, uh, but as far as it is an important measure, it's one we track carefully, uh, which means we remain confident that we'll complete the uh, programme of inspections in good time for the year end at the end of March. Um, we had a conversation, I think, at the previous board meeting about um, the, um, the underperformance in terms of uh, uh, the metric around reporting after inspections um, and a conversation about whether it was 
uh, appropriate to sort of effectively performance manage that and the dangers of um, cracking the whip resulting in, in the wrong reports or uh, reports weren't as good as they need to be. Uh, I think I gave assurances at that time that we would, we would do that thoughtfully and we would do it differentially uh, for the different sets. We know it is harder to put out an NHS report in 25 days given the complexity of the organisation uh, and the number of people simply on the inspections and our uh, regional directors have collectively agreed that it's more appropriate to aim for 50% of reports in the NHS uh, sector, uh, the acute sector, to be within uh, 25 days and 85% elsewhere. Um, we are making steady progress in aggregate, so I think we're up from 68% uh, in um, August through to 74% in October against that 85% uh, overall, uh, but we're not where we want to be. I mean, it's something we do focus on. Overall, on the transformation programme that Hillary oversees, we remain amber-red, which reflects the complexity of the programme, but we had a successful um, gateway review. Uh, the finances remain uh, unchanged uh, in terms of year-end projections compared to the last board update. That's a 2.4 million underspend on the revenue side and 7.1 million projected underspend on the capital side uh, and we're very much holding to the line that we will um, spend where we have firm plans to do so but what we absolutely won't do is uh, commit and spend money if we don't think it's good uh, value for money. Uh, looking at the risks side we have a number of strategic risks that doesn't mean that we don't also have a series of operational risks as well but in terms of the things which we monitor most carefully at the board um, we have five that are in the high risk category. We think we have the right mitigations in place. I think it's worth pointing out that they are high risk because of the uh, impact if they did occur rather than the likelihood of them occurring, which are all at medium. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Paul. Any, any, any questions for Paul, John? Chairman, thank you. Um, I was going to ask some questions about the transformation programme, but I'd like to do that under item six in the next part of our agenda I think which would probably fit better and it would fit with your time so I will limit myself to my regular query about the, the budget um, and I was struck very much last night sitting next to Matthew Swindell I think that you went to the States on and made a presentation yesterday um, who said that one of the I asked him what lessons he'd learned from his trip his time in the United States and he said that one of them was being very impressed by the way in which world-class organizations rated failure to forecast accurately their outturn spend was a greater sin than underspending. And I just wanted to share that with those responsible for forecasting our outturn for the end of the year, because the uh, underspend hasn't changed from the previous report. It's still where it was. Uh, and we now need to spend uh, more in the last f uh, five months of this year than we did in the first seven months in order to meet our target. So I, I just feel that um, at the next meeting, if we're still saying 2.4 million, then probably we're not as forecasting as accurately as we need to. David, you had a point you wanted to make about inspections. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. So um, just on the back of Paul's report, I had a discussion with the regional directors and other colleagues yesterday about whether in light of the fact that we've uh, and um, Mike has updated us on the progress with ways one and two that um, our workloads are running very very hot um, uh, staff are working incredibly hard and given that we have we're going to change significantly from the first of april our hospital inspection methodology uh, I'm going to invite the regional directors to give me their plans where they will only carry out hospital inspections between now and April on those where there is a risk or a priority and that we will not inspect those which are a low priority. So no routine inspections just because it's a time on the programme unless there's a risk that is presented by it and that will give some ease in because we're going to dramatically change our methodology for hospitals which we think are okay. There's no point in applying the old methodology to those inspections. I'm going to invite the um, regional directors to uh, just confirm that they'll remove those from the plan and that will then give more time back to some of the planning and the other inspections which need to take place. 
Um, just that I welcome that. I'd much rather we spent our time on where we think there are, there are problems, actually, even if it means we do a bit less inspections. I'd rather, you know, s switch more to quality than quantity. So I'm, you know, really, really pleased you're doing that. Um, also, I mean, have we thought ahead about our, um, you know, next, you said from the 1st of April we've got um, uh, the new um, sort of inspection methodology coming in. I mean, have we thought about the... Um, you know, how we're going to um, assess performance from, from, there, from then on? Um, it's a really good question, Kay, and uh, I think the answer to this is yes. This is why the early conversation about the surveillance on adult social care and primary medical services is so important, because we've taken our decision in relation to the, uh, choose one of Paul's phrases, the rhythm of our inspection year next year, based on the bandings on that risk surveillance. Given we've not got that, what we'll be doing next year is running our commitments thus far on adult social care have been we'll inspect everything once. The response to our consultations was, please don't diminish that. Uh, pretty unambiguously, I have to say. Um, we will move with ratings to a revised frequency for inspection and out social care, but the first stage is to get the surveillance and then we can actually get uh, appropriate risk into that. So next year, new methodology in from October, so we're going to run the old methodology from April to October and the new methodology from October. So the profiling of numbers... Uh, I hope this meets John's uh, metric of a good organisation. That's what... Um, uh, predominantly Paul's team along with the chief inspectors and their emergent teams I do make this point that some of these people just walked through the door a couple of weeks ago to do this work that's effectively what they're doing just to get that and the same on primary medical services um, so it's absolutely right but that's what we're trying to do and that's what's driving the numbers that we think we need to do the inspections next year and also trying to build in enough time for enforcement but this issue that Paul made brief reference to which is making sure that we don't just count the numbers that we've done but we've got some view about the quality of uh, that work which is being done as well and uh, we've been doing some work on how we capture quality not just uh, overall numbers. Yeah, We need to be very aware of the sort of changing context over the next year when we're sort of looking at our sort of performance we need to have the context not just the the numbers as well. Cause this, it's, you know. this year has been a planning year. Yeah. Next year is the transitional year. Paul, thanks very much. Um, Steve, did you want to say anything about the NICG? Yes, yes. Um, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, my um, second but final report from the NIGC. Um, as everyone knows, um, this is a, a committee that um, um, expires in April 2015. And um, part of our role is to um, bring um, information governance into the um, new inspection regime. And so I wanted to thank um, all the chief inspectors for um, accepting that this is um, uh, not only desirable, but um, needs to be done smoothly. Um, and I think um, I want to pay tribute to the quality of the members of the committee, who are all experts. And whenever we've had presentations um, from CQC staff about what they're doing, uh, which you can see we had a number out of at this last meeting, um, they have gone away genuinely impressed by the quality of contributions from the members of the committee. And I think it is proving very, very worthwhile. Um, so what we've got to do is, is this balance, I think, um, between patient confidentiality and the resource that properly shared data brings to patient uh, treatment. Um, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a moving target and developments are happening all the time. Um, and clearly the um, emphasis of the work of uh, our committee, I think, is going to be on the quality of sharing of the um, information governance rather than of um, holding on to it. Um, and there are really, really some very strange practices going on and widespread range. Um, and and um, I'm hoping that we can engage the inspectors and, and get a really good um, understanding of the, what is required um, when we integrate it into the inspection team. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the team at CQC who are really working hard. Um, and uh, in spite of the enormous pressure the whole organisation is on prioritising um, the new inspection regime, they're still finding time to do this, and um, I wish them all well. Um, Steve, thank you very much. And can I just take this opportunity to thank you very much, because as everyone knows, Steve is standing down in, at the end of December, going to be the chairman of the Whittington Trust, Whittington Health Trust, which is an integrated community and acute um, NHS hospital trust. So thank you very much for what you've done for us, Steve, and good luck.
the future will be coming round to inspect you in due course. Um, and oh, wait, sorry, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to carry on because of time. Anna, did you want to say anything to your report? No, good. Can I just quickly respond? Yeah, of course, yes, yeah, thank sorry. you very much. Sorry. I mean, I've had a great time. Um, we have actually got the lowest uh, mortality rate of any um, acute trust in the country um, um, at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, so I'm moving from regulator to regulated. Um, but um, I had a great time. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, I'm sorry to be leaving before my period of office is up. Um, but um, I suppose the next thing to do is to be uh, recruited to Mike's army, isn't it? Thank you very much, Steve. Um, any questions from the floor? Yes, David. Um, well, uh, Andrea was saying uh, earlier on that one of the sources for risk assessment would be uh, local authorities. Would the board agree? Thank you very much. Would the board agree that that the quality of this information would be very much improved if um, the Secretary of State would allow the resumption? of uh, inspection of uh, adult social services departments which have come to an end recently. Not the old whitewashing ones which we saw in the past, but the new demanding and probing kind of inspection that you're doing everywhere else. David, do you want to reply to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, this is a really interesting question, and it's one that is many of the adult social care providers want to encourage us into the space that the Commission for Social Care Inspection occupied, which is to perform and assess local authorities in the way that they commission. And um, I think part of my response to those, uh, Chair and, uh, and David, has been, actually, if you look at who's commissioning adult social care, in some parts of the country, 80% of people who are commissioning services are self-funders. And it's currently at about 47, 48% and rising uh, of nationally people who are self-funders. A significant proportion is commissioned by CCGs because it's nursing care or the nursing element of adult social care. So in a sense, if the challenge from providers is about who's assessing and holding to account those people that are commissioning, then there's a bigger discussion that needs to take place about who's commissioning and why and how. So that, that's one part of it. Um, the care bill, which is currently going through, will uh, give um, the Secretary of State for Health and Communities and Local Government the ability to ask us to review local authorities. And we can, under the current legislation, under Section 48, I think it is, carry out a special review which gives us a probe-based power. The Board have previously considered the report from Deloitte that said, you've got this power, use it strategically. Uh, so we could use that as well. But I think in that uniform, we'll go into all 152. Then I think we'd need to be asked and given the resources to do that and develop the staff to do it, I think is the straight answer. Thank you, David. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to, going back to the um, what you said earlier, um, David, about the and the duty of candor. Um, will the CQC actually, in the consultation in the new year, actually be, be sort of formally backing um, the the serious um, threshold um, for harm rather than the um, the severe threshold? Yeah. Yes. I think that's the fact that we've put that on the record in a public meeting. That's the reason I went further than the words in the report. And it's uploaded on YouTube as evidence for anybody to hit on and uh, watch. Uh, so I think, um, I hope it's unambiguously clear. And uh, we'll make sure that colleagues like Peter Walsh, who were anxious that we did adopt a, p a clear position, uh, we make contact with them after this meeting so that uh, Anna can do Health Watch, we'll do Peter and uh, those other organisations so they're clear. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I ask <coughs> a general question and uh, very quickly a, a specific question? Is there any structured uh, link between the inspections within CQC and those within Ofsted? And I should uh, perhaps declare an interest in that I have in the past qualified as an Ofsted inspector. And I had, um, I think, four residential weekends of training followed by I think about six hours of examination, which one had to pass. Um, and the experience of inspecting in education, which I think has lasted for over 100 years, could be helpful 
to the development of the inspection processes here within CQC, um, and specifically things like report writing, which certainly in offset inspections is a very definite skill which has to be acquired. That's a general question. The specific question is in inspecting um, uh, primary care and ge general practice. Um, can I be assured that when patients, carers, families are uh, met, that there will be some comparability between the listening event within hospitals and that in general practice, in that patients, carers, etc., can come forward and speak freely to the inspecting team. If I do the general one and Steve will do the specific one. So on the general one, there's been a number of contacts between uh, senior staff um, at a senior level and um, senior staff in Ofsted on exactly these questions, those how do you do these questions, what have you learnt over the years that you've been doing it. I know that David uh, has invited the chair of uh, Ofsted into uh, a dinner and uh, there's been a, a exchanges at the highest level, so it's a relationship that we continue to maintain. And then on some quite detailed work about inspecting children's services, um, we were in meetings with Ofsted as recently as last week. So it's operating at the very strategic level at governance, at what we can learn from them about how they've done some of this stuff in the past and training of inspectors is one. And then there's some just practical things that we must do with them about how we inspect and some of our inspections are joint with Ofsted. So it operates at those three levels. Do you want to answer the second? Well, thank you. Just on Off Ofsted, um, one of the things that I, that I really like uh, is the way they write to pupils and in a language that even junior school pupils can understand. And so one of the things certainly for, for primary medical services uh, that we'll do is, is write an open letter for the patients of a practice explaining, as well as them having the ratings in their waiting room clear for everybody to see. That's part of the new GP contract. Uh, discussion uh, negotiations um, there's a question about whether you write personally for to all of the the uh, patients in the worst practices but there's there's practicalities we need to to think through but the principle of being open I think Ofsted have taught us something very valuable um, the, the model for for us is that we'll be going into each CCG area and CCGs aggregate up to local authority areas every six months and uh, we're we've spoken this week had a really interesting meeting very helpful with health watch england and um we're talking to our own engagement groups about when we go in as this rolls forward year on year we'll be meeting with patients from all sorts of different groups as well as clinicians uh, our consultations will will inevitably cover social care as well as hospital care because the nature of good services are they collaborative and linked together and so as that moves forward, I think we need to learn lessons. Uh, and we um, communicate all the time, and we need systems in place so that we pick up concerns, and we also pick up great practice, so that if there's a, a really fantastic piece of practice between adult social care and general medical practice, perhaps on care homes, we need to pick that up quickly and disseminate it so that people can learn. So it works both ways, really. Good question. Good. Thank you very much. Well, it's... Um um, oh, sorry, there's one more question, is there? Sorry. Thank you. Just hopefully a quick question to Andrea, and this is about um, the pilot phase of introducing the new inspection methodology for adult social care from April till October. I think it's brilliant that those five questions are going to be asked of this sector. I think the general public will understand what the questions are, why they're being asked, and what it means for the services. I think that's an excellent development. But I'm just wondering about, in that pilot phase, how much differentiation will there be between the different sectors within adult social care, whether you'll be asking the questions in a different way or putting a different emphasis, and how will that work? Great question, thank you. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're developing the uh, 
the, the, the questions that we're going to ask in co-production with people who are using services in their carers, but also people who are providing services, so that we can we can kind of balance that um, uh, uh, and, and look at that. We're certainly looking at the difference between residential care and domiciliary care, you know, because uh, the different ways of, of having a look at that. And uh, we will be using that first phase very clearly, as Mike has already done in, in, in his uh, inspections, to run the first wave in a learning mode so that we're evaluating what's happened so that we can then uh, feed that into the second learning wave and then into the final, uh, the final uh, uh, approach, which will start in October. So, I'm expecting that there will be a differentiation um, because of the different nature of the services, but we're still working through on that detail at the moment. Thank you. Good. Um, thank, thank you very much, everybody. I think we'll have a quick break now for five minutes and then start again. But thank you for everyone from the members of the public who came along as well. Thank you.